So my name is Archana, for those of you I haven't had a chance to talk to in person. Um, I've been at Workday for about five and a half years now, and I lead up security product management for Workday. So the goal for today, at least for me, is to walk you through some of the aspects of my life, talk to you a little bit about product management, and then I had a little bit of chance to like walk around the room to see uh, where the pain points are, questions that you guys might have around getting into products. All right, so as I was thinking about how to, how to actually like um, have an interesting topic or a good way to like summarize what this session is going to be about, I thought of a butterfly. What better way to describe how people change and move in their careers, right? Um, and to start with, maybe you guys can turn around, take a second, and introduce yourself to the person next to you. And if you know the person next to you, there are always people behind you or in front of you. How many of you talked about your hobbies? <laughs> How many of you talked about life? <laughs> How many of you said your name to each other? We have one life over here. Yeah. What do you talk about though? Did you introduce yourself and talk about your work? Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's the subject line of the meeting. Right? Absolutely. But when we introduce ourselves most of the time, we tend to say who we are and Maybe talk about a couple of things about the event that you're in, maybe work or life related, and it slowly starts moving towards your work. You talk about what you do, because that's a core and essential part of who you are. That's part of your identity. And if you look at these, what comes to mind? What do you think these are? Names, Names and professions, absolutely. So the concept of associating oneself with their identities or with the profession is not new. Perfect. <laughs> that summarized it, right? It is true. That's what we do. We associate ourselves with the jobs that we do. And this has changed over a period of time. We, don't, we no longer follow this pattern of maybe baking or cooking, but we still carry those last names with us because that's that's what defined us at one point of time. That's what defined who we were. And if you see what happens today, change is absolutely the norm. Almost everyone is changing themselves because of the way the world operates. There is a change in the workforce. The place where you are and the device that you connect from defines where you're working from. You also see change in terms of who is employed and how those people are employed. Companies like Uber are changing the game with respect to employment. You're no longer associated with one company. You can work for Lyft, you can work for Uber, you can decide to work for Amazon and deliver things, or you can be part of Uber Eats and deliver food. So what you do is changing every day, which means that it's not a difficult thing to change and switch your careers. I think that's the common point that we're all getting to in today's world. So changing or moving to product management or changing or moving to a different part of your life that you haven't done before is not new. So I want to make sure that you guys understand that and break that barrier as you're thinking about transitions. And I'm not the only person saying this. We're seeing examples of several people in the world who've done this successfully. So Jeff Bezos, for example, made a switch from Wall Street to start an e-commerce company that's been the most successful e-commerce company when he was 31. Julia Child, you might know her for her cookbooks and recipes, but she started out in advertising. And she made a switch to secret services before moving there. Very interesting career switch, right? And then she's a celebrity chef. And if you look at Vera Vang, she was a figure skater. Who would have thought? And then she became a designer at the age of 40. So change is something that we embrace. And if we're confident of making the change, no one can stop us from making those changes. And that's where I want to talk a little bit about me. So when I started out my career, I had no idea what I wanted to do. My parents forced me into engineering, so I went to engineering school, and I got a degree in electronics and communication engineering. The one thing I knew, though, was that I hated coding. In my first year of electronics and communication, we had to take a comp sci class, and I really hated it. I knew that whatever I did, I just didn't want to do that. So that was the mindset I went with. So I finished my degree, um, and when I finished my degree, I was in India. And there was an IT boom, and pretty much everyone in my batch, including people who finished their biotech, were going into computer science. 
people were taking computer science jobs. People were coding all the time. And that's what I was told. Hey, if you want to succeed, you have to go learn coding. And I decided, absolutely not. If there's one thing I wouldn't do, that's to code. I'm going to figure out what I want to do next. So I decided to apply for a master's program. And I decided to come to the United States. So I applied to different schools. I got into Duke. So I said, all right, I'm going to take this. I'm going to move to the US. I'll figure stuff out. I don't have the money. I'll take a loan. And my parents actually pledged their house to get me a loan. And I said, I'm going to do that. Come here. Get a degree in electrical engineering. I'll get a job. I will never code in my life. So I came here, did my degree, got an internship with AT&T, which got converted to a full-time job. And I decided to graduate early. I decided to finish six months in advance. And right when I was going to do that, I was told that I no longer had my job. Because it was 2008, the economy was down, and there were no jobs in a lot of industries for international students. So I was told that since I was an immigrant, no one could sponsor my visa, and so I couldn't do the job that I wanted to do. All right, next step, graduated. I had 90 days to get another job because my OPT started. Right? You have an F1 visa when you come to the country. You get a 90-day period to get a job, and if you don't get a job, you get kicked out, and you have to go back. And to me, going back was not a problem, but the fact that I had a huge loan, and if I went back, my parents would probably kill me because I would make them sell their house, wasn't a good, ideal situation, right? So, all right, what do I do next? The only jobs that were open were software engineering coding jobs. You know where the story is going, right? <laughs> I was telling someone about this. So, um, I had met my then boyfriend, now husband, back at Duke, who's sitting in the room. Um, so I started talking to him a little bit about what I should do, and one of the things he told me was, make a wall. Like, you have many walls in the house, use those walls to like, think about how you want to prepare for your interviews. So what I did was I looked at the top 10 companies that were offering jobs, and then I looked at the job description for software engineering entry-level positions in each one of those, I looked at the keywords there and figured out which ones I knew about and which ones I didn't. Every time there was a word in the job description that I didn't know about, that word went on the wall. And then I did research on that. So by the end of like two to three weeks, I had a wall full of text written down and pasted in every corner. So every time I was taking a phone interview, I was sitting in front of the wall, looking at stuff. It was like distributed computing. Yes, I know what that is. I'm going to say it. And then when I got the job in, like, interview, I got a job interview with Deutsche Bank. So Deutsche Bank was opening their first technology center in Cary, North Carolina. And I walked into the interview um, wearing a white suit. That's what I bought. And then everybody else was wearing a black suit. <laughs> so I stood out in the crowd. I was the only person who walked in with a white suit. And apparently, all the interviewers talked about it. <laughs> um, and then I gave the interview talked to them, and at the end of the day, I got a call saying, hey, we do want to offer you a job, but the two things we went off of was how different you were, and the fact that you actually, like, and they joked about it. They said, we, we thought that you were different. Like, you stood out in the crowd because you told us very frankly right in the beginning that you hadn't done the job, but you were interested in learning and growing. And you also had done the homework required to, like, talk about every point that we asked you. You didn't fumble at any part, but you told us you've never done this before. So we're trusting you. We're hoping that if you took the effort to like learn all these things, that you would actually put the effort to do the job. And of course, I stood there and said, yes, I'm going to do the job. And I walked back home, and I was like, what on earth did I sign up for? I have to do this thing again. So I did the software engineering job for two years, and I'm not going to lie, I hated it. It was not my ideal job. It didn't give me happiness. It didn't make me feel like, I was fulfilling myself in any way, but I did it with the fullest commitment. It was hard. I had to put in nights and weekends to like get my job done. I was not the best compared to everybody else, but I was getting to a point where I was understanding why things were happening a certain way, why systems were developed a certain way. And I could see the pattern, and I could see how things were transitioning to the big picture. So we built a security system. That's what we did. We built an entitlement system. All the system was doing was looking and seeing whether a person had access to something or not. If they had access, we would give them the access. If they didn't have access, we wouldn't give them the access. And then what we did was at that point, I was thinking about how I can transition from there and started thinking about 
what I liked about my job and what I didn't like about my job. Clearly, I didn't like the coding. But of course, there are aspects about my job that I like. I like the fact that I could think about some of the ideas and bigger picture on why things were being done. I was good at talking to customers. I was good at gathering the requirements. So I knew that's the direction I wanted to go into. I wanted to be in the industry. I just didn't want to do what I was doing right now because every industry is huge. There are so many opportunities. And I wanted to find what my corner was. And once I found that, I actually had to figure out how to make the transition because there was nobody in Kerry who was doing the job of a business analyst or a functional analyst or any of that. So I had to convince four or five people in my management chain to give me that job. And the way I did that was I figured that was the easiest way to make the switch. I did 20% projects. I went to my uh, manager and said, hey, what can I help you with? Can I help you with some stuff that's related to customers? Because that's the extent that I knew about. I didn't know the existence of any of the other roles. So I used that to gradually step out of software development and move more into the area of um, catering to customer needs. I did that for about two years. And then at that point, I needed to move to the West Coast. So my husband got a job. He moved to California. And so I decided, all right, I'm going to pack up my bags, move over. But I didn't want to move over without a job, such as the nature of immigration. So I had to look for a job before I could move. So I started looking for product management jobs at that point, because a manager of mine told me, hey, why don't you look for a PM job that's the equivalent of what you're doing in the bank? So I decided to look for a product management job. And again, I started using the wall. So again, in Cary, North Carolina, I had a wall. I looked at the top 10 companies that I wanted to apply for, looked at the job requirements for each one of those companies, looked at terms I knew about, terms that I didn't know about. And of course, it's not just Wikipedia and looking at terms, but actually thinking about how I would solve problems pertaining to those aspects. So for example, if it said data life cycle, or if it said like product life cycle, I would actually research about what product life cycle meant in each company, talk to a few people on LinkedIn, actively connected with folks in the West Coast, asked them for 30 minutes of their time, got that time, and asked them what they did in their job. The more and more and more I asked people about what they did, the more and more and more I knew what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. So I could narrow down my focus and then finally interview in companies where I felt I would be a good fit. The other thing that I took into consideration was leveling. Of course, I had you know, certain years of experience in the industry, but that doesn't mean it directly translates into what I would be doing next. So I decided it was OK to like take a cut. So I accepted a job from Workday as an associate product manager, and that's where I started my life again. So we did a rotation program. We went from one area to another area. I did that for about a year and a half. I was the last person in my batch to graduate out of the program because I almost never wanted to graduate, to be honest. It was really nice doing projects from one place to another and gaining more and more information about how Workday operates and how people operate. So I used that, and then at that point, I decided that you know I wanted to graduate. I still like the security industry, so I wanted to graduate into the area of security. So that's what I did became a product manager for the security area in Workday. And then now I lead up the product management area for security at Workday. And for today's talk, I want to talk about three different aspects. A lot of times we ask for things. We ask for things because it looks glamorous. We ask for things because it looks like the best idea and best possible uh, way to advance our career. But we don't understand what that role actually entails. So I want to talk to you a little bit about my journey, what my understanding of what a product manager does, and then maybe we can get some conversations flowing at that point. The second part is about having a safety net. Every time you make a change in your life, it's important to have a safety net of some sort. And it depends on where you are in your career and in your life, and what's possible and what's not possible. And the last one is, of course, giving back. And that's why we're all here today. We're all There are volunteers in this room. There are people that are contributing back by like recruiting for their organizations, or you're giving back by like supporting people who are on stage, like some of my team members here. So whatever it might be, it's important to do that in order to maintain your connections, see what the industry is like outside of your small world. But before that, um, I know we're not in a world where we ask people to take out their pen and paper except the one person right in front. That's awesome. <laughs> but everybody else, if you have pen and paper to do that, if not, take your smartphones out and think about these questions. 
these are deep questions and I'm not expecting you to tell me an answer or to come back to me and like give what your answers are. But think about what are the three things you want by switching your career? And then what do you love about you know, your current role? What do you dislike about your current role? And of course, if you're a student and you're transitioning, the one thing I want you to do during this talk is I'm going to talk to you about different characteristics that are required for a person to be a successful and a great PM. So think about whether those characteristics are, you know, skills that you want to develop or you feel like those are not things that you ever want to do in your life. Because it's important to know that you're getting into something that requires you to be someone. And I always feel like it's easy to get into product management, but it's hard to be a great product manager. And being a product manager might be great today, but it's also one of those jobs that you should really know is probably at risk if the economy is down. So how do you be great? And how can you develop all these skills required so that if the time comes, you're still the best product manager in the industry, right? So the first and foremost thing is understanding the role. So an example that comes to mind is driving. So when I first um, thought about driving, I was about 16 and you can get a license around 17 when you're in India. Um, I was super excited. I wanted to get a driver's license and I knew that when I got the driver's license, I was going to drive to every single place. I, as soon as I got my license, I was telling my parents that I would drive, I was telling my brother I would drop him. If you ask me today, I hate it. Like my commute takes me an hour in the morning and an hour and a half in the evening to come back. It's one of those things I don't want to think about. And I'm one person who will be happy to let my car drive and if I don't have to worry about it. Right? That's where I am. And technology is going to, at some point, enable me to do that. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, but the point is, a lot of times we ask for stuff, but it might not be the best thing once the honeymoon phase is over. So very, very important for you to understand what this role means. And through the time that I've been a product manager, here are some of the things that I've learned. The first one is thinking big while building small. So every time you go to a PM interview, the first question they ask you is, what would you do if you were, and it could be anything after that, if you were, I don't know, the PM for the iPhone? Or what would you do if you were the PM for building Gmail or Google Maps? Well, reality is you're never going to get to a stage at this point in your career where that's your job, right? An example or something that comes to mind is two years ago, Workday decided they were going to construct a new building for all the employees because we're now in different campuses. It's so hard to get between campuses and talk to people. We were shown a photo and we were told this is the futuristic building we're going to be in in four years. And they said it's going to accommodate everybody Everyone's going to be in that building. It's going to make our life so much easier. And we're going to construct this. So of course they came up with the photo and a way to describe what that building was going to look like. But then at that point, so much else went into actually making that building a reality. Right? There were workers. This is one of the construction photos. But there were people actually making small changes, incremental changes to make this possible. If you went and asked any of these workers what this whole building was going to look like, they're not going to know because they're working on the smaller nitty gritty details. And that's, that's sort of, you know, if you take that back to the analogy of product management, your product leader in your area and your CEOs define the vision and tell you what exactly you want to build. And then as individual product managers, you have smaller components or areas that you are the CEOs of. So it would be, what would you do if you were building the home button for an iPhone versus what would you do if you were building the iPhone? So I think it's important for you to know that when you go into a company, especially as a product manager that's starting out, it's important to keep the bigger picture in mind while you're building the smaller components that are needed to get you to that bigger picture. And when you think about the coming back to the construction analogy, they were building this building for four years, but they were still having meetings with us to ask us about the designs. They asked us if we wanted a cafeteria. They asked us if we wanted like a shark tank. There are probably some people who said shark tank, but it's probably a terrible idea, right? But they're constantly changing what goes inside the building. So the structure is complete. We know the big picture and the vision, but there are always changes that you can make to the components with it. 
And as a product manager, it's important to understand that it is not about you. No decision is personal. It is not about you, but it's about the people that are actually going to occupy those buildings. So keeping your customers in mind, having those constant conversations to understand what's going to satisfy the customer base is very, 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 very important. And some companies, depending on the companies that you're applying for, might have UX designers to help you with some of those research activities. There are other companies that might not. When I first joined Workday, I didn't have a research partner. So I had to do a lot of this stuff myself, and I didn't know if I was doing a good job or a bad job. Yeah, I can go ask people. A lot of times, as humans, we come up with solutions. We don't talk about the problems. But abstracting that out, getting people out of that solutioning mode and getting them to talk about the problems is an essential skill that a product manager needs to have. You constantly need to think about the problem we're solving versus diving into solution mode. There are several people in your organization that can help you get to the how, but it's important to understand why you're building something and what you're going to build. So understanding your market needs, team strengths, company priorities, these are things you see in job descriptions. But do you have specific questions about any of these? I want to stop now because I do want to make sure that if you have questions about any of this, I answer those before I go on to the next one. We're going to talk about some heavy topics in the next two or three slides. All right. So again, it's important to build for the future. So you know what happened? They told us about this building that they were going to build that was going to have all of us. But they told us this year that we get to look at the building. Because our headcount planning was way off. They didn't, they didn't, they're not going to be able to accommodate all the people in that building that they're constructing. So we sit in the places where we sit, we look at the building, we know that building's going to come up, we were part of the design, the strategy and everything, but the requirements weren't clear. And we didn't consider a lot of things that needed to be considered, so the building that they just constructed, which is a six-story building in Pleasanton, which is supposed to be the biggest building that we have in Pleasanton, is not going to house all the people that it was supposed to house. So four years of work, and I'm pretty sure if the company knew this before, they would have constructed two more floors, right? Or they would have changed the design or gotten more land. But if you don't consider all the aspects that you need, a lot of people design for today. You look at what your customer is asking for today. And you know what that leads to? Scale issues 10 years from now. If you think your company is not going to exist 10 years from now or your product's not going to exist 10 years from now, it's perfectly fine to design for today. But if you think that you're going to triple or quadruple the number of people that are going to use your product, then think for the, those numbers when you design for today. Think about the changes that are going to happen in the industry and how your market is going to change based, to, based on those changes. And then use that to like influence your product design. The next part is about ownership. So when I was young, I was part of a music club. So I was a vocalist. We had people who played like different instruments. And we were part of the same group for almost five years. So we knew each person's strengths and weaknesses. Like they knew the key I could sing to. They knew like the pitch I could sing to. And if there are places where they knew that I was not going to sing to key, they would compensate by playing loud or like drowning my tone or my voice during the concert. They also knew the places where I would make a mistake. And yes, I constantly made the same mistakes over and over again. So every person sort of knew and adjusted based on other people's weaknesses and flaws. We knew what people's strengths were and we let them shine. And we knew the places where we were weak and we helped each other. And ultimately, what happened was the orchestra or the band got the name or the fame if we did well. And if we didn't, we all got dinged, right? It's important to understand that as a product owner or a product manager, you own your product. And when people say that, they really mean it, because when it comes to blame, people are ready to blame the one person. So forget the credit part, but at least with the blame, you know that it's going to come back. And the point to make is, it's important to leverage the strengths of your team. A lot of product managers think that they are a one-man, one-woman show, and that they can come up with a product roadmap, the product strategy themselves, and that's their key job. Your job is to orchestrate the best of your team members and bring those views together to get stuff going. Which is why when there are people in the room that ask me the question of, hey, I don't have a technical degree. I don't have a degree in computer science. 
Neither do I. But what I do and what I can bring to the table is to ask the right questions to make sure that people in the room give me the answer that is required for me to make the decision. At the end of the day, the job of product manager is to be able to solicit information from every possible area and to be able to use that information to make informed decisions. So it's driving consensus more than being a single person in charge of taking decisions. And that's what they're looking for in interviews. So if you think that they're interviewing you and asking you for a question and looking for you to like give an answer, you're completely wrong. They're looking for how collaborative you are, how you're able to work with the resources that you have, how are you able to understand their strengths, how are you able to cover up their weaknesses, how do you build product in such a way that you can leverage the best of the resources that you have in your hand. That's the job of a product manager. If I start a company and if I'm the CEO of a company and if I had two people to work with, and let's say both those people are Java developers, do you think I'll go and build something in C++? That would be a bad idea. So leverage the strengths. Think about what you can do with the team that you have. And that's the most important thing that you can do as a product manager. And the next part is defining KPIs. You can do this for your job hunt. If you are hunting for a job, have KPIs for yourself. Say that in this week, I'm going to look at five different companies that I care about. I'm going to look at five different job positions. I'm going to research on five different people who are currently doing the job in that company, going to make that list, reach out to those people, and I'm going to see if they get back to me to talk to me. That is a good KPI measurement that you can have for yourself for a week. right? It doesn't have to be for product. So when people think about KPIs or data or metrics, you don't have to be scared about these things that you're looking at because everything applies to your everyday life. So as long as you can apply some of these concepts to your everyday life, there is a great definition and a great way in which you can tell the interviewers why and how you apply data to your life. You might not have relevant experience at your job because maybe your job doesn't require you to be data driven. But if you're from school and if you have a structured way in which you think about certain things and a goal for yourself to self-motivate yourself to do things, that's what people are looking for. As a product manager, a lot of times you're on your own. I tell people I've had four manager changes in the past year. And people ask me, how do you manage that? It's like, I manage my career. If I manage my career, it shouldn't matter who my manager is. My manager is there to support me. I look at my manager as someone who can help me in places where there's more political capital required to get stuff done, not to guide me through my everyday job. That's not what I need my manager for. And if I'm in a position where that's what I'm looking for from a manager, then I'm not advancing in my career. Right? And then delivering on all aspects. So a product manager's job doesn't stop with defining the product requirements. If you are the master of the whole thing and if you're ready to take the credit for doing something, then you better be part of every part of the cycle. So you should be part of the initiation, the ideation, bringing the right people into the room, influencing them, motivating them about why your idea is great. Because we all have our jobs and so does the other team. So if you want someone to work on something for you, you better tell them why they should be doing that work versus their own work. And that's something you're going to see in every company. Every company is going to have teams. Every team is motivated by their own things. And you want to be influential and you want to tell them why your idea is important. And if you have to be able to answer those questions, you should be solid in your foundations and why you're building something. If you're not able to answer that, then you're probably building the wrong thing or you're not investing more in the basic things that are required to be a good product manager. Last one is jack of all trades and master of some. It's important when you start out your career. When I started out in security, I did not know anything about security. I did not have a degree in computer science and I avoided it like a plague, remember? So I did not know anything about this area. But I learned things on my own and I learned things. Of course, it's not saying that you have to learn everything, but start small. See what your job requires. Start learning that. There might be adjacent areas that are interesting. Start learning that. It takes time to develop expertise. And I think understanding that and giving that time is very important. And consistency is key. You don't get to learn everything in a day. So give it the time and you will see the benefits. Communication and connections. So one of the best things I did was actually joining the APM program at Workday, or any company for that matter. You can join um, any company. But the idea is 
as an APM, one of the things that I did was I moved from one team to another. And because I moved from one team to another, I was able to form connections in each one of these teams that I was going to. And I realized that the best part about a product manager's job, or sometimes the worst depending on who you ask, is the fact that you get to form so many connections. And remember that people, we're, we're really bad at looking at other people and saying no if we know them. So that's placed to our advantage as product managers. So they're at least ready to sit and have a conversation with you if you know someone. And a lot of times as a product manager, you need things from people. So if you're somebody who hates talking to people, this is probably not the job for you. If you hate confronting people or talking to them about the decisions or ideas that you have and why those ideas are important, this is not the job for you. If you hate conflicts, this is not the job for you. So these are some of the things to keep in mind because these are lessons I've learned through my life. I hate conflicts, but I learned to love conflicts or at least like embrace it and encourage um, discussions when there are differences of opinions. The, again, understand that the best part about being a product manager is the fact that you're going to have five different opinions on the table and you're going to be the person that takes those decisions or those opinions and form a decision out of it. So your life depends on influence. You have to be able to influence people in order to get anything done because you're not going to have the development team report up to you. And a lot of times what happens is you have to build that credibility. People want to see that you are a great product manager before they trust you and give you projects to work on and let you take decisions. Because decision making is a very powerful thing. Almost everyone wants to have an opinion. Everyone wants to be able to take decisions. And if you don't establish your credibility right in the beginning, then they're not going to be able to trust you. So that means that when you come into the team for the very first time, do whatever it takes to like understand what they're working on. Because it's their baby. They've been working on it for a long time. They feel like they have better context than you do. What you bring to the table is your skills as a product manager. What they bring to the table is the domain expertise. So tell them it's OK. You don't want them to feel threatened in any way. So you want to tell them that you embrace the fact that they have the domain expertise. What you're bringing to the table is to be able to extract that and to take the best possible decisions to take your team to the next level. That's what you're doing as a product manager. You're facilitating change, and you're bringing in aspects that they haven't thought about to the table. And for that, your connections are important. Your devs might come and tell you that you, they want to be able to change the UI layer. And you might be working in the security team, like I do, and we don't have a UI layer. So I'll have to go talk to this UI team and tell them why my project is important when UI touches every aspect of the company. So there are going to be different teams going to the UI team asking them to make changes. So why should they do mine versus somebody else's, right? So it's very, very important to have influence. And for you to have influence, you really have to understand the why. Being prepared. How many of you have been to meetings where you came out of the meeting thinking, what the hell was that meeting for again? Why was I there? <laughs> well, I guess I, get, I got 30 minutes to do my work. I'll just like not complain and just sit in the meeting and do my stuff. We've all been there at some point in time in our lives, right? And that's exactly one of the things that a product manager typically should be doing, is to be prepared and to drive meetings. You should be able to come into a meeting and say, thank you for your time. Here are the three things that we're going to be discussing today. By the end of this meeting, I, we want to walk away with one, two, and three as our action items. And you should be able to keep people on track, because there are a lot of people who like to get sidetracked. But you should be able to pull them back with your goal and say, hey, that's a great conversation that we've been having about this topic, but let's table that for another time because we have very important people in the room and we want to get some consensus before we move on to the next meeting. So being able to drive that is very critical. So you should have the power and the influence and the, the, the I wouldn't say the authority, but I would say the, the charm to actually make people listen to you even without the power that you have. Right? And last one is, of course, empathy. You have to understand your audience and, you, and their motivations. Every single person that comes into a room to sit with you to talk to you has a motivation. They have something that drives them. They have their own personal goals. They have their own team goals that they are trying to optimize for. Right? And this is not exclusive for a product manager job, but it becomes more important for a product manager job because you're the one driving decisions. It's important to understand that any person that is sitting with you in a room, in any meeting, has a motivation. 
they are there for a reason, and that reason might not always be aligned with you. So understanding what incentivizes them, understanding what motivates them, will make you more powerful in that meeting, because then you can drive your decisions and the way you position things based on what you want them to sort of like take away. So if you know that someone's like eyeing for a promotion in the next cycle, maybe you want to pitch the project as an interesting, important project that has visibility at the the you know the higher up level or in the management level and show them why it's important for them to work on it. If there's somebody else who's looking for a launch or impact, then you can show the impact or the impact of that particular launch um, to the the person sitting in the room. It's important to understand the why and also be able to translate that why and to be able to tell that to the person in the room so that they know and understand why it's important for them to work on that project. It shouldn't be like, yeah, that person came and asked me. I couldn't say no, so I said yes. We're just going to do a shitty job and like finish this stuff and move on. But it should be a, hey, this project was super interesting. They pitched it to me. They told me why it's important. And now I want to be part of it because that's a huge project. It's going to change a lot of things, and I want to be part of that change. So being able to influence people is very, very important in this job. This defines my day. Nothing goes as per plan. My to-do list never get done. There's uncertainty in my life at all times. I'm constantly in meetings. There's never a known entity that I deal with. And it's always escalations. And time management is a very important and interesting skill to have. I want to prioritize my time because if I don't, I could be in meetings from 9 to 5 and feel extremely busy and go back home thinking, what did I do with my day? I don't think I accomplished anything. And before you know it, it could be months. And you would be like, what did I do in the past five months? Well, I went from meeting to meeting. I guess I had my lunch, met my coworkers, and it was OK. So it's very, very important to understand that if you cannot deal with ambiguity, if you always want to have a sense of accomplishment when you go back home that day. Because as a developer, you might be used to seeing three stacks or I, I don't know, is it like post-it notes that you use or Jira queues? Like three things to get done within the end of the sprint. And when you're done, you're done. You're never going to have the sense of completion in product management. You will get that during launch time, but you'll also be the first person to hear from the customers as to why that product was bad or what changes they want in the product, right? People tend to forget the good. It's like, all right, you gave me that feature, finally, all right. Here are the three things that I want improved in that feature. So the sense of accomplishment or the sense of done, it's all self-motivated. Like you have to drive yourself and you have to be happy about some of the smaller accomplishments that you're doing as you're progressing towards a longer term, higher goal. So it's easy to think that it's a job that is glamorous and sexy, but it's, I almost think of it as a job that's equivalent to acting. When you see the final product, it's all great. But then the amount of work that goes into it is really bad. The auditions, the number of hours you send, spend on the sets, the amount of time that you spend overnights and weekends. So those are all things that come up. So I have people who come up to me and say, oh, you went to Vienna for Workday Rising? That must have been awesome. But what they don't see is, yes, I was in Vienna, but I was also working at night. I was also working on my presentations before that during nights and weekends. I did give a presentation to the executives, but then I spent the past two weekends working on it. So those are all things to keep in mind. And I do that because I love my job. It becomes a chore if you don't love it. So that's the point that I want to tell you. If you love it, it's a great job. But if you don't, it might be depressing sometimes when you don't see results immediately or when you don't see the sense of accomplishment when you go back home and say, all right, the five things on my to-do list got done. Most of the times I go back home saying, all right, I added three more to my to-do list for tomorrow. Right? So we just talked about understanding the role. I wanted to summarize it a little bit. Talked about four points. We talked about th thinking big while building small. We talked about the importance of ownership and being accountable as a product manager. We talked about communication and connections as being key to this job uh, or you being successful in this job. And then we talked a little bit about ambiguity and chaos. How are we doing on time? Um, we'll move to the next one, which is having a safety net. As humans, it's really hard to make changes at once. A lot of times it's circumstances that push you to make certain changes in life. 
a lot of times you feel like this is the right time for you to make the move. And we all, as a community, like comfort and safety, which is why they always say if you're not learning, like think about a new job. But it's not like we follow that to the T, right? A lot of times we stay in the comfort zone for a long time before we move. And there might be so many reasons for that. Maybe your job's paying you really well, and it doesn't make sense to move. Maybe you're optimizing for something completely different. So I sort of classified it into four different categories. Um, family and friends, financial and immigration, psychological and fallback. The first one is financial and immigration. This sort of falls into the story that I told you about my move, right? I hated doing coding, but I was forced to actually do that because of the fact that I needed that for financial reasons and for my immigration status. So it was necessary to make that switch. But just because it was necessary to make that switch, it doesn't mean that I get depressed or stressed or annoyed that I have to make the switch. But I think about, all right, what's next? What do I do? So if that means that I have to make sacrifices in the evenings or like find a zillion people to like talk to to understand what those roles are going to be like and prepare for it, then that's what I'm going to do. Versus like sitting back and like worrying about the fact that now I have to take a new path in my career. And again, thinking about what you do if you quit your job or if you lose your job is important. Many people like get into product management or think about product management. This is a great time to think about product management. We're in an upward trajectory with respect to the economy. But at some point it's going to cap, at some point it's going to fall. At some point, there are going to be jobs that a CEO has to look at and say, I'm going to rank them in this order, and these are the jobs I'm going to cut. And I accept my job is probably one of those. So are you ready for that? If that happens, what is your fallback? What are some of the aspects that you've thought about from a financial perspective? How is that going to be part of, what are you, how are you going to switch? How are you going to pivot? Just keeping those things in mind is important. The next one is psychological. This is one that affects a lot of people. If you are making change, it is a hard decision that people make. And it makes people worry a lot because it's the unknown that they're going towards. And again, it's the same thing. Having a clear plan is important when you're making these huge changes in your life. So understanding if you have what it takes. And what I mean by that is understanding what it requires or what the skill sets are that are required to make that change. Those are some of the things that we talked about in the previous slides. What about those skills excite you? What about those make you feel like, all right, this is not for me? How many of those are you comfortable saying, I want to learn? Those are things I'm not good at, but I can learn those things. What are the things that you look at and say, you know what? That's not something I ever want to learn. I don't want to be that person because I'm different. And that's a totally OK answer to have. But knowing what you want to get into and what it's going to be like after you get into is very important. And again, it's easy to get a job. I know it's hard to get a job in product management, but I'm saying like it's easy to get a job in product management if you really put your heart and soul into it. To succeed and be a great product manager is hard. And I think that's where people make the mistake. You can make the switch, but if you want to climb up the ladder and be that person who's defining and building the iPhone versus building the home button, you have to be really good. And having a 30, 60, 90 day plan when you move to a new job, what is going to be your exit strategy? If you make the move and you hate it, what are you going to do? How are you going to get out of it? What is your backup plan? How are you going to think about making that switch? And what are your transferable skills? What do you have today that map to the skills that are required for being a product manager? And how can you talk about those during an interview? And it doesn't have to be in the same space. It could be in a completely different space. So think about the skills that we just talked about, and then see which one of those you've done before be it communication or collaboration or being an accountable owner. What are your stories? Think about those stories and write them down. It's important to be a good storyteller when you're a product manager. So write down two or three stories for each one of those skills to demonstrate ways in which you've actually done that in your life. Having a fallback. If you're in a company and you're switching companies to move to a different role, it's important to leave in good terms. If you leave in good terms, you always have a fallback. You can come back to that company if need be, and if things didn't work out well for you. And it's important to be open about why you're leaving. That's something that you owe to the company that you're leaving. And it also makes it easy for you to like establish that actual open, trusting relationship with that person that you're leaving behind. And saying, hey, this didn't work out because of the fact that I want to switch my career and move into a different space. 
maybe they'll say, you know what, I'll make that role for you. Because that was the conversation I had. I said, I hate doing what I'm doing. I'm not good at it. I constantly feel like I'm pushing myself. But there are people with master's degrees in computer science who are competing with me. I'm never going to be as good as them. I can catch up, but it's going to take me a long time. And I don't wish to make that change in my life because it's not something I want to do. And having that conversation made my manager talk to me about like other areas, like being a business analyst or being a functional specialist. And that's how I made that small switch in my career when I was at Deutsche Bank. And then I was eventually able to pivot and move to Worte. And the most important people in my life that supported me the most when I made that switch were my managers and my coworkers. They all stood behind me. They would ask me after every interview as to how I did. These were people that knew that I was going to leave the company, leave a hole that they had to fill. But they were behind me the whole time. And these are people that still keep in touch with me. And as a gratitude, I gave them like four weeks notice instead of two weeks notice. So we're all humans. We help each other. So don't be afraid. Ask for things that you want. But do that in a nice way. If you give people stuff, they will always give back to you. And there's, there's always going to be doors that open for you. There are always going to be like people that you did not expect that are going to help you in your lives. And yeah, transitioning within your own company. We talked about this. There are possibilities of you transitioning to a role within your own company that gives you more opportunities, very less risk. It's easy to like take up a small project. You can go see someone within your company that's doing a role and ask them, hey, can I help you with your job? Is anyone going to say no? Like People are going to be open. If you say, hey, I'm trying to learn what you do. That's the role I eventually want to be in. Do you mind mentoring me? Or can I work with you on a project? Like I can work outside of office hours if required to like do your work. And I'm pretty sure people will be open to like helping you with some of those things. And family and friends. Like I've, I've always had backup of like people in my life that I really trust, that really care about me. And we're not different. So don't be afraid to like reach out and ask people for help. There are always like my, my parents stood behind me when I had my initial sort of like shock of I have to leave the country in 90 days. I have no idea what to do. I have paralysis. I want to like, I don't know what to think about. Right? My family was there behind me. I had my friends who were there to encourage me. We were all encouraging each other as we were making change. I had my coworkers who were helping me when I was making that switch to product management to move to the West Coast. And I constantly have people both at work and at home today that are there to support me in every move, that are there for me at any point of time. So you leverage your networks. It's very, very important to have your networks around you. And that's very important as you cope with pressure and stress. It's interesting that if you talk about your problems to people, they will tell you how they've handled some of those similar kind of situations in their lives. And unless you talk, you're never going to know. You're going to assume that you're the only person in that situation, but many people have gone through stuff. So it's important to find that group and that network to talk to. So again, we talked about having backups and safety net. That was the second part. Uh, very important for people to think about this. A lot of people try to do things by themselves, alone, without looking at the repercussions of their decisions in the next like four or five years. But I'm thinking about it as a product manager today. Everything in my life is prioritized. My time is prioritized. The people I spend time with is prioritized. The stuff that I work on is prioritized. Things that I give back to the society is prioritized. The same way, having a safety net should also be part of your priority queue when you're making these huge switches. And the last one is giving back. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, I leveraged networks when I was looking for a job. I contacted eight different recruiters at Workday. I got rejected eight different times by Workday. And the ninth person got me through. So don't give up just because one person says you don't have the job. If you believe that you are qualified for the job, make sure you get it. Right? And those eight people still work at Workday. Um, but yes, I reached out to eight different recruiters who did not pass on my resume. And then I figured out that there was one person from Duke um, who worked at Workday. So I reached out to that person who then passed me on to someone who called me for an interview, and that's how I got my job. So do not give up. The power of networks is huge. And if you leverage someone to like get help, I never saw this person because this person left the company before I joined Workday. So I never saw the person that gave me that connection and that inroad to get into the company, 
But my way of giving back is giving back to people I don't know. Because that's the best way to give back. So think about your networks. Be more strategic about the people you connect with. And think about like how you can give back to them so that they can help you as well. And once you're in a position where you feel like you have enough, that you've learned to give back, start giving back. It's very important. And a lot of times people tell me, I don't think I have enough to give back. But you're wrong. If you actually think about it, if you dig deeper, and if you have the right person to ask you the right questions, which is our jobs as a product manager, you can always get so many interesting things out of people. We've all done unique things. So those experiences are what other people are looking for. So don't think that you don't have much to give back. There's always a lot of stuff that you can give back. We're all unique in our own ways. And offer your skills. And when you do that, you automatically become a leader. Think about the number of people that you meet in your everyday lives that have touched your lives in interesting and different ways. And you go to them and say, hey, can I connect with you on LinkedIn? Can I contact you later? Do you have a business card? Those are all natural leaders that you've met in your lives. So you can be one too. And that's how you build your confidence. That's how you build some of the skills that you think you don't have. Right? We're not natural presenters. My very first presentation was really bad. Like my slide deck looked really bad. And I'm not kidding. And from there, you get to a point where you feel comfortable standing in front of people and talking about things. I still have my nervous jitters, but I'm getting to a point where I feel like I can do it. And when you practice, and practice enough, you, f you know that you have actually got it at some point. And that's the most important thing. And that's the point where you feel like you can lead other people, you can tell other people, you can teach, and you can coach. And it always goes back to the question, what would I do if? And it doesn't have to be an iPhone. It could be you just changing the way things operate in our everyday lives, even if it's just this clicker, which is weird because you press the down button to get things moving. <laughs> right? So someone decided that that was the best design. And we're talking about it today. So you could, you could change the world however you want. Um, I wanted to put up a few books uh, that I read recently that are interesting, um, that I thought would be useful for you guys. Of course, you're part of the product school, but there are also other groups and areas where you can look at interesting product, um, look at how to do things. Of course, the Silicon Valley is full of a lot of people talking about product and technology, and sometimes it can be confusing, and sometimes it can be conflicting, because everyone has their own style. So follow what you feel is the most important and interesting way to like, gain information.